Good morning and welcome to our service today on this eighth Sunday after Trinity. But actually we're going to be celebrating St James the Apostle today because it's the 25th of July, which is his day. So our readings come instead from Acts chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 20. Our preacher this morning, and we welcome him, is the Reverend John Honeysett. And the service today comes from St Mary's Sopworth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness. And that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisites and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have tolerated too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have let undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 
Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us not rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with songs. lesson is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great darth throughout all the days of the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now about this time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Here ends the first lesson. The proper psalm for today is Psalm 7. O Lord my God, in thee have I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he devour my soul like a lion and tear it in pieces. While there is none to help. O Lord my God, if I have done any such thing. Or if there be any wickedness in my hands. If I have rewarded evil unto him that dealt friendly with me. Yea, I have delivered him that without any cause is mine enemy. Then let mine enemy persecute my soul and take me. Yea, let him tread my life down upon the earth and lay mine honour in the dust. Stand up, O Lord, in thy wrath and lift up thyself because of the indignation of mine enemies. Arise up for me in the judgment that thou hast commanded. And so shall the congregation of the people come about thee. For their sakes, therefore, lift up thyself again. The Lord shall judge the people. Give sentence with me, O Lord. According to my righteousness and according to the innocency that is in me. 
O let the wickedness of the ungodly come to an end. But guide thou the just, for the righteous God trieth the very hearts and reins. My help cometh of God, who preserveth them that are of true of heart. God is a righteous judge, strong and patient. And God is provoked every day. If a man will not turn, he will, not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with mischief. He hath conceived sorrow and brought forth ungodliness. He hath, give, he hath graven and digged up a pit, and is fallen himself into the destruction that he made for other. For his travail shall come upon his own head, and his wickedness shall fall on his own pate. I will give thanks unto the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will praise the name of the Lord Most High. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second lesson is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus had answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with? And they say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared for by my Father. And when the ten heard of it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called upon them, called them unto him, and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for the many. Here ends the second lesson. Before his presence. 
say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Let us pray. Grant, O most merciful God, that as thine holy apostle St. James, leaving his father and all that he had without delay, was obedient unto the calling of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and followed him. So we, forsaking all worldly and carnal affections, may be ever more ready to follow thy holy commandments through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, we are taught by thy holy word that the hearts of kings are in thy rule and governance and that thou dost dispose and turn them as it seemeth best to thy godly wisdom. We humbly beseech thee so to dispose and govern the hearts of Elizabeth, thy servant, our queen and governor, that in all her thoughts, words and works, she may ever seek thy honour and glory and study to persevere to preserve thy people committed to her charge in wealth peace and godliness. Grant this, O merciful Father, for thy dear Son's sake, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit. Enrich them with thy heavenly grace. Prosper them with all happiness and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time, with one accord, to make our common supplications unto thee. And as promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come everlasting life. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, this service for the Sunday, the um, 25th of July, the Feast of St. James, um, is coming from the little church of Sopworth, which is in the end of a no-through road, a cul-de-sac, in the tiny hamlet of Sopworth, which nestles on the border between the south of Gloucestershire and the very north of Wiltshire. The parish church is dedicated to St. Mary the Virgin, 
and they think it was first built in the 13th century. The date isn't absolutely certain and was then extended in the 15th century. There was, like so many medieval churches, a huge restoration done in 1871. The village has lots of rather fine Cotswold buildings. There's the old manor house, which dates from about um, 1700. It was again altered like so many places in the 19th century. The farmhouse is a 16th century building, uh, while the manor and North End farmhouses date from the 17th century. So it's a very small little community, but a very beautiful one at that, in a lovely part of England. Let us pray. O God, may we hear your word. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your word, so that your word may become so much part of each of us, that we may bear witness to that word in our day-to-day -day lives. And in so doing, bring the kingdom of heaven down here to earth. Amen. Well, as I said a moment ago, um, today is the feast of St. James, St. James the Great, St. James the Apostle. And the name St. James was a hugely common one, a time of our Lord. Mary was another very common name. So it's hardly surprising that in the New Testament there are actually five Jameses, individually quite different from each other, that appear. Two of them were apostles, one St. James the Less, and he was the son of Alphaeus. We know absolutely nothing about him. And the other apostle was he whose feast we celebrate today. The third James was known as the Lord's brother. And we think that he wrote the epistle to James as part of the New Testament. And he also became Bishop of Jerusalem. He was the one of them that didn't travel quite as much around the world of their day as the others did. And he also, uh, he was, became Bishop of Jerusalem, whilst Peter became Bishop of, in Rome. The fourth James, Mark tells us, was the youngest son of a Mary. And the fifth James was, according to St. Luke, the father of Judas. Well, St. James the Great, or St. James the Apostle, as he was also known, was the brother of John. And they, like Peter, were fishermen. James was the first of the apostles to be martyred. He was beheaded by Herod Agrippa I in AD 44. It is perhaps ironic that whilst he was the shortest living apostle, St. John, his brother, lived the longest of all the apostles. There is a tradition that St. James preached in Spain, and that his remains were taken to Santiago de Compostela. It is doubtful whether he actually ever preached in Spain, although in the Middle Ages his shrine was a favourite goal of pilgrimage. And it is to St. James that we owe some of the finest Romanesque basilicas in Europe. Well, we don't know very much about St. James's life, and certainly less about him than about some of the other apostles who survived him. In AD 44, Christians were still expecting Christ to return at any time, and no one was yet committing what they knew about Christ and his followers to writing. It didn't seem necessary. Besides, there wasn't really time. However, we do gain a colourful picture of James from certain glimpses afforded to us in the Gospels. He was a fiery, impulsive type, not unlike Peter. And it's small wonder that they were friends long before Christ met them. One day, he and his brother tried to stop a man casting out devils in the name of Jesus. Master, we saw a man casting out devils in your name, and because he is not with us, we tried to stop him. Well, that, of course, provoked Jesus' remark, anyone who is not against you is for you. On another occasion, Christ was on his way to Jerusalem, and the messengers he had sent ahead of him into a Samaritan village met with hostility as they were reaching it. And James comes up with the bright suggestion, Lord, do you want us to call down fire and burn them? 
Well, Christ had gathered some real characters around him. And then, of course, we have that well-known moment recorded in this morning's second reading, when James and his brother boldly come up to Jesus saying, Master, we want you to do us a favour. Allow us to sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. Well, you can imagine the wrath of the other ten as they looked on. The biblical record encourages us to see James in two lights. First, we see him wanting honour and wreaths. Secondly, we see James the martyr. Now, Jesus had to convert his apostles. James and his brother John spoke to Jesus of honour and wreaths. Jesus spoke to them of contests and sweat. Jesus tells them that now is not the time for glory, nor is now the time for the glory of Christ to be revealed. True glory is never achieved without hard effort. The glory may be attractive, but the effort often isn't. At the, the royal tournament or any military tattoo, we see all the glory and razzmatazz of military life. But this is in sharp contrast to the bloodiness of battle. During the blood and sweat of effort, what we are doing may often be misunderstood until the results are achieved. We see this in the debates of the House of Commons, where the government is challenged over every decision it makes. Jesus' ministry is misunderstood, and the church is often misunderstood. Take, for example, the members of the congregation who fill our churches at Easter and at Christmas, but who never appear in Advent or Lent, either because our teaching has been inadequate or because they misunderstand what discipleship of Christ is about, and they fail to be there at other times other than the festivals. Now, the other ten apostles are no better. They are jealous of James and John asking for the honours. However, after Jesus' resurrection, all of them are free from inclinations towards positions of honour and carry out Jesus' life of service for God's sake and for his creation. Despite their shortcomings, Jesus had a special affection for these rogues among his apostles. There were times when he would take James, Peter and John, where he just wouldn't take the others. It was them he asked to be with him in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest. It was the same three who he asked to come with him to the house of Jairus as witnesses or supporters when he brought Jairus's daughter back to life. And perhaps most significantly of all, it was again James, Peter and John who Christ invited up the mountain to witness his transfiguration. He knew they would be leaders of the church that would be formed after his ascension. Their faith in him was of greatest importance. James met his end largely as a result of the worsening relations between Christianity and Judaism and Judaism and the Roman government. Pilate was not very sympathetic to the Jews and the Roman emperor saw the exclusivity of the Jews being a threat to the Roman world and he sought an end to the Roman-Jewish alliance that went back to Pompey's defeat of Jerusalem in 63 BC. Herod was desperate for support from his own people and equally concerned to appease Rome. And he discovered that he could achieve something of what he lacked by beheading James. Peter, that other firebrand, was to follow next. Well, we don't know much about them. Nevertheless, we celebrate St. James as a brave hero of the early church. 
His early demand for honour reminds us that as disciples of Christ, we should not be seeking good things for ourselves in this life. If good things happen to us, then it is through God's gift or the gift of others. We do well to be inspired by St. James's boldness and our Lord's acceptance of him. Amen. May God grant you a vision of our land as God's love would make it. Where the weak are protected and none go hungry or poor. A land where the benefits of civilised life are shared and everyone can enjoy them. A land where different races and cultures live in tolerance and mutual respect. A land where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. And may he grant you the inspiration and courage to build it. And the blessing of God, the source of all authority, King of kings and Lord of lords, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>